So today's colloquium is titled Network Science and the Digital Humanities, Applications, Opportunities and Challenges for Interdisciplinary Research in a South African Context. And our speaker is Birgit Sienekal. Uh, Birgit is currently a research fellow at the Department of Computer Science and Informatics at the University of the Free State. After obtaining his PhD at the same university in 2013, he investigates information technology, big data, and network science with particular emphasis on Afrikaans literature studies. As an NRFC-rated researcher, he has already published more than 80 articles and four books. So with that, uh, I gladly uh, give over to Birgit, and I will then stop sharing. Okay, let me just uh, share my screen again. Okay. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Birgit Sienegal, and I would like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. I always enjoy talking about my research because I, I enjoy doing the research. And maybe someone else uh, could find it interesting as well. And I would actually like to see more people apply network science in a, a South African context. We are very few people working within this um, uh, this paradigm. So hopefully I can uh, um, I can um, motivate someone to uh, join us. Now first of all, what is network science? Uh, let me first just say, um, um, of course I'll make uh, this um, this presentation available afterwards. Throughout the presentation, I have put in some references, and those are references to my own publications on the topic. And I do that because network science can be mathematically very dense. And if you are interested in the topic and you start reading and you end up encountering the wrong sources, you run into this wall of mathematics. But me coming from a humanities background, of course, I uh, try to explain everything in simple, normal language. So there are references, and uh, that might be an easier way to get acquainted with the concepts. Now, what is network science? According to Albert Laszlo Barabasi, who is one of the key authors in network science, the field emerged around about the year 2000. Now, what happened at the time was computers were becoming more powerful uh, and cheaper and therefore more widely spread. The internet was uh, becoming more, um, more popular. And with that, um, the data explosion happened. And there were two key uh, papers in the late 1990s, the one by Watson Scrogatz in 1998, and the other one by Barabasi and Albert in 1999. And they uh, um, inspired people from the physics community uh, to start looking at networks. And uh, in the early 2000s, then computer science was combined with statistical mechanics, uh, with mathematical graph theory, and with social network analysis and uh, a few other fields, and something new emerged. Uh, something focused on large networks, big data, and uh, improved algorithms and that kind of thing. But of course, uh, network science didn't emerge from uh, a vacuum. So uh, it can be traced to 1736. Uh, that's the oldest root of mathematical graph theory. Um, uh, that was uh, Leonard Euler's Königsberg bridge problem. Graph theory is an important component of network science, and as a, uh, um, as a consequence of that, we uh, often refer to networks as graphs as well. Now, uh, since the early 2000s, 
it has become an, uh, an approach within complex systems. But it was also uh, considered part of general systems theory by the father of uh, GST, uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, way back in the 1960s. So basically, network science is a mathematical approach to systems. Now, where does social network analysis fit in? Um, social network analysis is a component of network science, but of course, it focuses on social links between people or animals. I've, you know, I've seen studies on social uh, networks between baboons and dolphins, for instance. Uh, so uh, if you're looking at, for instance, the character interactions in a literary text, you know, that will be a social network analysis application. But network science is much broader. You can look at transport networks, trade networks, uh, um, uh, um, uh, it has uh, so many more uh, applications than simply social network analysis. But also, uh, network science is applicable to virtually any kind of relational data. Uh, you don't always have to be uh, focused on what is defined as a system, an open system, a complex system. Any kind of relational data can be usefully analyzed using uh, network science. Now on the, on the right hand side there, I uh, highlighted some important names in the development of network science. I already mentioned uh, the paper by uh, Barabasi and Albert and by uh, Watson Strogatz, and I mentioned Leonard Euler as well. Um, Stanley Milgram uh, is of course also an important name with his six degrees of separation study. Mark Granovetter with his um, strength of weak ties study. And Jacob Moreno was an important role player in developing social network analysis. He, he practiced what he called uh, sociometry in the 1930s. I also want to highlight uh, the name Kurt Levin there. Um, he was the original source for you know, Pierre Bourdieu's uh, field theory which in Afrikaans literary studies is often combined with Itamar Ibn Suar's polysystem studies. Um, so there's actually a, a link between the development of social network analysis, of which Kurt Levin is part, and um, the application of field theory uh, in the contemporary uh, South African literary environment. Now, when it comes to analyzing networks, you can take a macro level, meso level, or a micro level approach. Now, a macro level approach looks at the structure of the entire network. And the two key measurements are small worldedness and link distributions. Small worldedness is after that paper by Watson Strogatz, and you know, link distributions after the paper by Barabasi and Albert. Now, what small worldedness is, um, Often when you meet someone new and you start talking about who you know, you find you've got uh, acquaintances in common. And then a typical thing people will then say is, oh, it's such a small world. Now that's exactly uh, what small worldness refers to. Uh, that uh, common acquaintances uh, in network theory is called clustering or transitivity which is one of two ways that uh, small wilderness can be measured. The other one being uh, um, the amount of hops it takes to reach one node from another node. That's uh, Milgram's six degrees of uh, separation. Now, the other uh, major application is link distribution patterns. And uh, I don't think I'm going to go into detail there, uh, but it, it just uh, says that um, the number of links a node has follows a power law instead of a, a Poisson distribution. Now, um, these macro level studies, to me, feel like they've got limited application in the humanities. There are applications, but um, I see a lot more applications for meso level and micro level studies. So what a meso level study looks at is basically the uh, formation of groups. Uh, we tend to refer to that as communities. And um, 
one way to identify the communities is by using the concept of modularity. And that's what happens there in the example network on the right. Yeah, you've got groups of nodes with a lot of internal links uh, that make them identifiable clusters. Now, another you know, meso level application is to look at the core and periphery structure of networks. If you're familiar with even to our polysystem theory, you're probably familiar with the concept of core periphery as well. Um, the core is established, it's important nodes, it's highly connected, and the periphery, not so much so. Now, in a micro level study, you're just looking at the importance of individual nodes. Uh, um, uh, very popular ways of uh, determining that degree between its closeness and neutrality. Page rank is the original algorithm behind uh, uh, Google, and eigenvector centrality is also important. There are other ways, um, cut centrality and hits and that kind of thing, but these are the most important, most popular uh, ways of identifying important nodes. And what they allow us to do is take a large network with 40,000, 100,000 nodes and identify key role players. Now, uh, let me tell you about a couple of applications. Uh, coming from literary studies, of course, most of my applications are in literary studies. So first thing I looked at was the literary system. That ties in with uh, even so our polysystem theory. And it basically looks at the relationships between role players like authors, their books, um, uh, publishing houses, critics, scholars, uh, where books are discussed. And if you're doing a, a micro level study, you can then identify the most important authors, critics, uh, um, publishing houses, etc. At the moment, I'm actually uh, working on uh, um, core periphery structures as well, and uh, that uh, there it allows you to identify the core of the literary system. Now, another uh, study I wanted to highlight uh, regarding the literary system is the road network. Now, you can, uh, um, you can study a road network as a network by looking at which roads intersect with which other roads. And that's usually uh, an application in geography, but we have a neighborhood in Bloemfontein called Langenhoven Park, where most of the streets are named after Afrikaans authors. So by analyzing that road network as a network, I was able to identify the key roads and then look at who they were named after and compare that to a literary history. So this is one of the most valuable things I think about uh, network science is taking an approach from a completely unrelated field from your own and, uh, and adapting it uh, for looking at your subject. Uh, that study was one of my favorites, was one of the most exciting studies I've ever done. One of my goals is uh, if I can look at a completed study and think, okay, this is weird, but it works. Uh, um, I like that feeling, so I, uh, I might try to go for that. And uh, that Lang Langenhoven Park study was, uh, um, was typical of that feeling. Now, character relationships are another application. We are just looking at who is married to whom and who is father of whom and, uh, um, and so on. That study actually started when I was teaching um, Etienne van Yerden's Tourberg to students. And the students complained that they didn't know who was related to whom. It's, uh, it's a farm novel, it's you know, set in a rural environment. So uh, it's a very intricately related group of characters. So I, I figured if I uh, um, could represent uh, the relationships as a network and just show it to the students, then 
uh, they might be able to understand it. And once I had the network and I started playing around with the calculations, I realized that some of the meaning of the text was actually encoded in those relationships. So I ended up finishing the whole thing uh, and publishing an article on it. Now that fourth application, that's uh, probably the, uh, um, uh, the, the application of network science in literary studies that's done most often. Just normal character interactions, which character is talking to which other one. Um, a famous person who did that was um, Franco Moretti, who looked at the character interactions in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, uh, and I've seen uh, interesting studies on the medieval Icelandic saga uh, in that way as well. Now, um, uh, I did that one study where I looked at character interactions in, in Piffon by Klaus Germanicus. And also in that uh, in that article, uh, um, I gave a, uh, an overview of uh, similar studies that have been done overseas. Uh, so that's a typical social network analysis application. One of my challenges there is just if you do micro level study, you end up with a conclusion like um, Germanicus is the main character in the play called Germanicus, which is uh, um, doesn't really tell us anything. So I ended up relating some network features to um, what the Russian formalists said about literature. And I'm mentioning this because um, having subject specific knowledge is incredibly valuable when analyzing networks. So uh, um, I don't want people from the physics uh, uh, community to look at literature. I want people from the, uh, I want literary scholars to look at literature from a network point of view, because you have a different kind of background. Now, the fifth application there, social media is less about the text and more about what's written about the text. So in one study, I looked at the conversation around uh, Dion Mayer's Twitter profile. And in the other two, I looked at hashtag co-occurrence networks on Instagram. Um, uh, their um, uh, hashtag is a node, and if they co-occur in the same post, there's a link between the two. And then by doing a meso-level study and uh, running the modularity algorithm, you can then see which hashtags cluster together. Uh, so I did the one on... Um, canonized Af Afrikaans authors and another one on um, the discourse around um, around Ingrid Juncker. And then that sixth application, uh, I wanted to highlight that in particular, because even though uh, network studies are known to be uh, big data studies, it doesn't have to be big data. Uh, you can find smaller applications. So I was uh, um, looking at word co-occurrence networks where um, uh, words are nodes and there's a link between the two if they occur next to each other in a, in a text. And I came across uh, this one poem by uh, Joan Hainbich and I, uh, um, I drew it up as a word uh, co-occurrence network and started experimenting with layouts and some calculations. And I discovered that it, the structure actually said something about the meaning of, of the poem. And uh, I thought that was so interesting. I uh, ended up finishing it and publishing an article on it. Now, um, what sets that study apart is using big data methods for a close reading. Franco Moretti uh, talks about distant reading and all the quantitative methods we can use in the digital humanities to look at uh, literature, but it doesn't have to be uh, um, a distant reading. It can still be a close reading. So all of these applications are very different applications, uh, all uh, relating to literature. Uh, um, so there are actually a lot of opportunities. Now, uh, um, in terms of word co-occurrence networks, 
Um, yeah. On the right hand side, uh, I gave an example. Um, is there a pound on a station in the metro? So you can see how that works. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. You can remove stop words. You can indicate semantic links rather than syntactic. Um, there's quite a lot you can do with word co-occurrence networks. We've only so far uh, looked at macro level studies where we compared Afrikaans to English and Dutch. But um, I've seen some exciting overseas studies where they used co-occurrence networks to determine the quality of a text or marking students' essays, for instance, for determining the authorship of a text, the genre of a text. You can even use it for topic modeling. Word co-occurrence network, MESA level study, uh, run the modularity algorithm and that identifies topics. So topics are also, uh, topic modeling doesn't have to be a machine learning thing. It can be done within uh, network science as well. Now, film and theater obviously uh, lend themselves uh, to a network representation. You have a, an actor that stars in a film next to another actor who stars in another film. Um, on the right-hand side, there are some uh, links of Jamie Ace in the Afrikaans film industry. Um, also, there's a study on Pierre de Wet and one on Kwes Roots, and also a MESA level study, but that, that one was complicated. Um, now, obviously, if that works for film, it also works in theater. So I looked at the, um, the Afrikaans theater network around the um, arts festivals. And uh, what I want to emphasize about that study is uh, that's where I talked about the small world phenomenon in the greatest detail. Uh, Stanley Milgram's uh, Six Degrees of Separation, um, the Kevin Bacon game, uh, and uh, how all of that works. Now, obviously, you know, we don't have to look at contemporary data. If you can find historical data, network science can help illuminate fascinates of, um, facets of, of history as well. So in, in one study, I looked at the World Trade Network, where a country is a node and there's a weighted link between them based on the amount of trade. And then using uh, um, centrality measures, I was able to show the impact of sanctions on South Africa during the 1980s. Uh, even more interesting is the arms trade, where, uh, um, of course, countries are nodes again. And then there are ties between them if heavy weapons are traded between the countries. Uh, that's what rep what's represented on the right-hand side there. So you have the US in you know, blue, Soviet Union in red. Uh, this is obviously uh, during the Cold War. ANC in green and South Africa during the uh, um, 1980s in, um, in orange. And what you can see from there is obviously ANC groups closer to the Soviet Union and South Africa closer to the US. So if you then uh, apply something like modularity and you group the entire world into two factions, uh, um, uh, that's when it becomes interesting uh, to see uh, um, how the arms trade reflects political alliances. Now in that second application, I looked at the University of the Free State um, uh, uh, similar to the Langenhoven Park study, we've got a, a neighborhood next to the university, Universitas, where all the streets are named after people who were involved in establishing the UFS. So by analyzing the road network, I was able to find out that um, the uh, um, most important streets were named after people who were involved in establishing the UFS as an Afrikaans university. So that tells us a little bit about the layout and history of Bloemfontein and, uh, um, and also the University of the Free State. Now that, that third application, terrorist networks, that's something 
uh, almost entirely separate. Uh, uh, in the intelligence community, like the CIA and the FBI, they've been doing link analysis uh, since the mid uh, 19th, uh, mid 20th century, and later on adopted uh, social network analysis as well. Uh, so if you're interested in intelligence analysis from a network perspective, I wrote a lot about that uh, in that article, and also analyzed the links between um, role players in a local terrorist network. Now, the, uh, these applications are what I'm calling other because I don't really know where it fits in. On the right hand side there, uh, you've got countries and they're linked if their recipes share ingredients. Um, this is from a forthcoming article. It should still be published in this year. And by uh, running algorithms, you can find out which countries group together. And then the question is why? And in answering uh, the question of why, you have to go into the history of, um, of diet, basically. I ended up going all the way back to the Copper Age. So that's 5,000 years ago. And I found traces of historical um, dietary patterns that are still found in um, contemporary recipes. Uh, this is a 20, uh, 2022 data set. So I, I thought that was particularly interesting uh, to see how ingredient combinations uh, are still being used the way they were thousands of years ago. And that, that second application, overlapping directorships, that's usually in economics. So you have a, a, a director who sits on a, a, a board of a company with another director and you draw up a network from there. So usually you look at the JSE, uh, for instance. But it doesn't have to be applied only to economics. In one study I looked at, uh, um, overlapping directorships in um, organizations in the community of Orania. And uh, by analyzing it as, as a network, uh, I was able to find out that Orania foregrounds um, uh, community empowerment projects. So if it can be done for Orania, it can be done for other communities, providing of course that they're uh, um, uh, organized as well. So uh, um, like with the road networks, uh, transferring uh, ideas from economics to uh, studying cultural communities, uh, um, I enjoy that, um, uh, that uh, I'm going to call it drift of ideas between disciplines and breaking down the silos. Now, the last uh, group of applications are science of science applications. So basically studying science itself. So typical application there is citation analysis, uh, who's citing whom, and uh, co-authorships as well, who's, uh, who's publishing papers with whom. Now, in the citation analysis, you can find uh, the most important sources if you want to do a micro-level study or even groups of sources um, uh, on a meso level. Co-authorships is uh, a bit less useful in the humanities than it is in the natural sciences. That network on the right-hand side there is one journal in organic chemistry. So you can see that's a highly connected um, network. Whereas in the humanities, we of course do a lot of single author papers. So we're not as connected, but collaboration is increasing the humanities as well. So it might become more useful in the future. And then I added topic modeling there um, through word co-occurrence networks, um, because if you want to get an overview of a field, like let's say the digital humanities in South Africa, these three network measures are the best way to do it. Uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, in any case, uh, you'll be able to identify important authors, 
important sources, important journals, and uh, um, you know, topics for applications. So uh, on to challenges. Um, I organize these in um, order of difficulty. The most difficult problem um, uh, uh, since I started doing this 12 years ago is getting unstructured data, data into a structured format. All uh, um, social uh, all network analysis software will require uh, rows and columns uh, um, in a spreadsheet format, a typical an edges sheet and a node sheet. So um, we don't usually have uh, structured data as input data in, uh, in the uh, humanities. I remember when I first started talking to people in computer science, I argued that language has a structure. They just told me no. Um, uh, text is unstructured from a computer science point of view. So you have to get the data in the right format in order to be able to analyze it. And that is time consuming, especially given the size. Now, sometimes you can automate some parts of it. You might be able to collaborate with people in computer sciences, um, but not always. Uh, and at other times you might be able to do things yourself. For instance, um, if you have uh, Instagram data and you want to do a hashtag co-occurrence network, you have to figure out how to extract those hashtags. You can do that with a regular expression, but it's something new you have to learn. Now, uh, obtaining the data uh, has about the same, uh, same level of challenge because uh, um, where do you start with? Um, every social media platform has a different way uh, that you can get the data uh, to begin with. And scraping web pages as well, it's also a different skill to learn. And it differs between the websites you're scraping or the social media platforms, and it changes. Um, a few years back, there was a an app that allowed you to scrape uh, uh, Facebook posts and the comments. And I was still figuring out how I could use this when Facebook changed their API and, uh, and, uh, and closed it. So it's no longer working. And just in this year, Elon Musk uh, closed uh, um, uh, Twitter's API, now X, and uh, thereby uh, making uh, Twitter data are very, very difficult to obtain. So you have to adapt and uh, start looking at new platforms, learn how they work, um, uh, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. So there's always going to be a, a learning curve uh, and a never ending uh, learning process. Now, the easiest part uh, is probably learning to use the software. Most network analysis software isn't particularly difficult. Um, uh, I've mentioned R and Python there uh, um, because I know both of them have network analysis packages. I don't use it myself, but I see Sadilar offers training courses in R. So uh, that could be a useful skill to learn also for cleaning up the data to begin with. Now, um, if you are interested in um, uh, getting into network science and you want to play around with uh, um, some South African data sets. I only recently started making data sets available and I've only done these two, the Afrikaans film industry and the poetry system. Now the poetry system is uh, like I was talking about earlier, uh, different role players and, uh, and their ties uh, um, for that period. The Afrikaans film industry is now a good example of how much donkey work you end up doing. Um, it's easy to scrape uh, data from the uh, Internet Movie Database. You can even do that from within Google Sheets. But 
IMDb is not complete when it comes to Afrikaans films. Um, I saw the one film, I think it was Arinda. Um, according to IMDb, there were three actors in it, but according to the film itself, there were 27. So uh, we had to go to the films themselves to get a, a, a comprehensive and trustworthy data set. And I still can't uh, think of any way we could have automated that. So we ended up pausing uh, the film and typing every single credit over onto a spreadsheet. So a lot of donkey work with no uh, options for automation. No, but that's uh, that's part of uh, uh, of network science. Now, in conclusion, um, I hope I've been able to show that there are a wide variety of applications, and uh, there aren't any fields in the humanities or in science in general where you can't find a use for uh, um, uh, for network science. Uh, also, if you're a little bit creative. You can uh, find new applications that haven't been done before. Um, but unfortunately, the large data sets remain a challenge. Sometimes it's useful to collaborate. Sometimes it will require learning new skills. But at times, you will be doing a lot of donkey work. And uh, nobody likes doing that. But the payoff. I think makes it useful and because doing something interesting and different, uh, I find that very enjoyable. So in conclusion, uh, um, I would just like to extend an invite. If someone's interested in network science uh, and you need advice on applications, software, some training, uh, um, you're very welcome to contact me. I would love to see more people get involved in this field. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Birgit. I really hope everybody is as inspired. Oh, I enjoyed this. Uh, I think you really showed, um, I want to say, the, the need for collaboration, which uh, should definitely uh, I want to say be a priority in this broader network of people combining uh, computational methods with, um, you know, humanities, literature, film studies, all those things. So uh, I want to say thank you so much. I see we have a question in the chat. I will read it out. Uh, it's from Sarah Lee asking, when we have multilingual audio data, is there a way to use network analysis to find which words map to each other? An application I can think of is when we are going through audio archives containing language of critically endangered languages, and we are now trying to document those languages in efforts to revitalize them. In many of those archives, you have a speaker in English or Afrikaans asking, how do you say X? And then a vernacular speaker giving the word in their language. Can we run some kind of network analysis on this? Well, um, you can run a network analysis as soon as you have it in a text form, in a written form. So it sounds to me like um, you will be needing some machine learning to convert speech to text first. If that answers the question. Yeah, she can also feel free to unmute or just uh, react in the chat if your question is answered. And then uh, from Carolina, a very interesting topic. Thank you. I have the following question. Are there studies investigating the development of networks? So with the focus on the process itself, showing the diachronic development, could you give some examples? Yes, um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we tend to look at the static networks uh, because it's a lot simpler, but uh, actually uh, um, all networks are dynamic and they're, uh, they're always uh, evolving. Now, Albert Laszlo Barabasi, uh, um, in his 
uh, original network model from 1999, he talked about um, uh, the concept of preferential attachment and how the, the network grows. Uh, but uh, um, uh, uh, and a lot of people have subsequently also published on, on preferential uh, attachment. It's also called the, the Matthew effect. But analyzing a network as a dynamic network, uh, that brings specific challenges. It, it can be done. Um, I, I prefer Giphy. Uh, so I have actually done that um, in, in only one study, but it is a little bit more difficult. Uh, so there's a whole new field of, of people looking at uh, dynamic networks. Um, I think if, if you send me an email, I can uh, refer you to some sources. Okay. Then the next question, what special contributions does this digital network analysis make to our knowledge in literary, linguistic, film, or theater studies? Well, um, uh, one particular thing is um, we've approached the Afrikaans literary system as a system for um, for many years uh, since the early 1980s, but it's always abstract. It's uh, it's not provable. Um, network science makes uh, the study of uh, literature a lot more scientific. Uh, um, if you run the algorithms over and over again, you find the same answer. So it's a it's a harder uh, form of science. Uh, than we've been doing so far. And also it allows you to take a much larger data sets um, into account. Uh, there's no real way you can uh, do a qualitative study of the Afrikaans poetry uh, system from 2000 to 2022 with over, um, I think it's over uh, 400, close to 500, poetry anthologies published in that period. There's no way you can handle all of that in a qualitative study. So a quantitative uh, um, approach like networks helps you deal with much larger data sets. Hey. Uh, and then, as you know, polysystem theory is central to translation studies and the work of Ivan Zohar to re and Sela Shefi, <laughs> focus on repertoire formation and canonization. My study is on networks of translations and translators, and I'm planning to show this process in science fiction. Would you suggest a method to show the diachronic networks of translation repertoire formation, or in other words, how to display the change of networks throughout time? Yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, uh, all you'll, you'll need is um, uh, when ties existed, so you, uh, you need to uh, put a timestamp on that. And um, uh, then you can basically move a slider forward and see what it looked like at different times. Um, publishing that kind of thing is a little bit difficult because you actually need to show that in a video, not in a um, in a normal image, but it can definitely be done. Okay. Uh, what new things does it bring over and above how we traditionally do literary and film studies? Well, um, uh, we're always finding new ways of looking at, at literature. Um, you know, this is a, another way of, of doing it. Now, as I said in the previous uh, answer to the similar question, um, looking at much larger data sets, um, quantifying relationships and, uh, and making it more um, closer to the hard sciences. Uh, um, 
I especially liked the idea of working with massive data sets and, uh, um, and quantitative methods, algorithms. Um, so uh, I think I answered most of it in the in the previous question, um, unless there is uh, some follow up. Yeah, I think I think so too. But yeah, feel free to keep commenting in this very live chat. Uh, Carolina says thank you, and then uh, Sarah Lee says thank you. Yes, STT will be easy enough for English Afrikaans where we already have those models. But for saying Mu or Nama, it needs to be transcribed first. And then, yes, I guess it's about whether we can start to use machines to help us understand language structures of these endangered languages where there are very few speakers left. So use machine learning to facilitate efforts to save or revitalize them. Okay, that was uh, just a comment. And then, yeah, um, the researcher on the science fiction translations also says thank you. Uh, so any other questions? Thank you for the very live chat. Uh, yeah, we have a question you know, here from the boardroom. I might have a question if nobody's, um, <laughs> if nobody's uh, writing any questions in the chat. This is more of a practical, um, very practical question. Um, I actually did uh, a little bit of network analysis on results from questionnaires. So you're relating the answers that people give to the questions that they give. And then you see kind of similar patterns emerge, right? How, how people typically answer these questions. Um, and so my, my first step was to try and actually understand what does it mean if you start relating questions to the answer, but I, I'm, I'm beyond that now, so I'm, I'm there. Uh, but you mentioned a, a number of different metrics that you can you can apply to these networks. But how do you how do you figure out what kind of the meaning of these metrics are in a particular network? So if we're thinking, for example, of questions and answers, so how people answer questions in a questionnaire, you can look at um, degree of centrality. Um, and degree of centrality, that all sounds really cool and it's a nice term, and, but what does it mean in this particular context? Or if you think about the, the recipes uh, that, that, that you start relating. So what kind of metrics would you choose and how do you decide or how do you figure out what these metrics then mean in this specific context? Yeah, that's why um, um, subject specific knowledge is, uh, um, is absolutely crucial. Um, you first have to figure out what centrality measures normally mean. Um, like degree centrality is normally a, um, an indication of activity. Um, it only means, uh, uh, it only measures uh, the number of direct connections and node has, whereas uh, um, uh, uh, closeness centrality means it can, uh, uh, that node can reach every other node on average in a short path. Uh, uh, these are the, the generic meanings. So, you then do have to figure out for yourself what does it mean with my data. Um, so, uh, um, uh, you you will actually have to experiment and and see what makes sense. Okay, thanks. I was hoping for an easy answer. There, but it's really, <laughs> really you need to think about what it all means. Thanks. Okay, I think if there's no more questions, I want to thank everybody. Uh, we are finishing within the hour, I see. So, um, yeah, I think it was very lively discussion. I think, uh, especially Berge, showing the challenges um, um, to implore us to you know develop structured data sets, then we can do amazing new things with them or look at it in a different way. Um, but for that, we need a few things to be <laughs> in place. Like you mentioned the donkey work and, you know, sometimes there's no other choice but to go and do it. Otherwise you can't do the interesting things. So yeah, I want to thank everybody and wish you a very good day further. Thank you everyone. Thank you.